Welcome to Rubber Band Live, the Australian recruitment and talent acquisition vodcast and podcast. I am Eden Haddock, your host and the creator of Rubber Band, the recruitment network for all. Let's go live. And we are live. I am so sorry for the delay. I had a bit of a technical issue, but we are live. Thank you, everyone, for your patience. Uh, Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that I live and work on, the Wadawarran and Jar Jar Warren people. I recognise their continuing connection to the land and waterways, and I pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging, and extend this to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Welcome everyone out there for this edition of Rubber Band Live, Talent and Recruitment, What Do CEOs Really Want? I am so excited to be joined by three CEOs today, Anthony Seymour Walsh, Sarah Lyons and Mark Gates. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Good afternoon. Thanks Happy for having no, no, it's an absolute pleasure. So let's let's get to know you a little bit. So I'm going to start by, I guess, a quick intro. T- tell us a little bit about your career, a bit of a summary of who you are. Um, we'll start off with with Anthony. Keen, keen to hear all about you, Anthony. Not that I Thanks, haven't Eddie. met you before. <laughs> <laughs> you have met me before, yeah. We work together very closely. Um, so I'm currently CEO of Cash Awards, which is Australia's largest cash back business. It's the place you come to get cash back when you shop online and in store. I've been enrolled for four months. Prior to that, I was with Eden at Flybys, um, Australia's favourite loyalty program, uh, in a chief commercial officer role, looking after our partnerships and our data analytics team. And prior to that, I've done a variety of finance roles. I'm a chartered accountant by trade, but wanted to step out of the out of the numbers and into influencing business more holistically. Um, so yeah, a really varied background, but uh, it's really great to, to be with you all today. Thank you so much, Anthony. It's an absolute pleasure to have you. So thank you so much for joining. Um, Sarah Lyons, t- tell us a little bit about yourself, a quick summary of who you are and a little bit about your career. Hello, everybody, and thank you, Eden, for inviting me on. Um, I'm the chief exec of Gallagher Insurance Brokers and well, I've been chief exec for nearly six years, having arrived in Australia about 10 years ago. Um, I've been in the insurance industry for probably more years than I care to mention, 30 plus. Um, but I now have the great privilege of being able to look after a business that's got 36 locations across Australia and I get to visit them all, which is tremendous. Oh, how wonderful. Thank you so much, Sarah. And and thanks for joining us today. And Mark Gates, tell us a little bit about yourself, a quick summary of who you are and a bit about your career. Thank you, Eden, and and nice to see everyone. Um, Yeah, actually, interesting, my my role and and Anthony is very similar, come from that corporate finance background. So again, a chartered accountant by trade, um, went to step into more operational roles um, and yeah, so worked on a number of large and small businesses in the corporate finance, um, operational and corporate strategy roles. Um, stepped out of those roles for possibly one of the most challenging roles of my life when I took a year out to be a stay-at-home father and um, without doubt the, the hardest role of my life. Um, and I ultimately set up my own consultancy business, which is how I found my uh, way into my current role, which is the CEO of Vanguard Laundry. So Vanguard is the, one of the largest not-for-profit um, businesses in the country. Um, and we're helping change people's lives. So it's a good opportunity to give something back and also you know, challenge myself in a slightly wider role. Wonderful. We've got such a great variety here, I suppose, in terms of industry. And um, it's really great that our audience that are working in different sectors are able to you know, hear from, from the three of you, Sarah, yourself in Fin Services, Mark, not-for-profit, and Anthony in um, Consumer Tech. So we've got a really great variety here. Now, just a reminder, if you do have any questions, I'm hoping everyone is able to um, have connected through to the event today. We had a little bit of a technical issue at the start. Um, please pop your comments and questions in. But I've got a question for all three of you, and I'm going to go around the room because I love this question. I think it's always fascinating, particularly for those who are starting out their careers that are aspiring to become a CEO. Tell me about your first job. Anthony, what was your first job? My first job was working for Bilo, which is a a now defunct supermarket. They were purchased by the Coles Supermarkets Group. Um, And for me, I, I had a variety of roles. I ended up as a duty manager I worked on checkout. I used to look after fresh produce, dairy, and even replenishing grocery. And for me, what it, it taught me three key skills. One is customer service and the importance of really connecting with your customer. 
The second was standards. Having good standards in that environment is critical. And the third was business systems and processes and the importance of that underpinning everything that you do to have that consistency. Wonderful. Love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. How about yourself, Sarah? What was your first job? Oh, right. so my first paid job whilst I was at school, I was a chambermaid. And I can honestly say I really wow. do not like cleaning bathrooms as a result of that. But um, <laughs> my proper first job um, in, the, in the workforce, I worked in a bank. Oh, wow. So initially starting in the back office and then made my way to be a cashier. Fantastic. Wow. And Mark, how about yourself? Yeah, so like many others, I uh, sort of few summer, Sunday, Sunday and summer jobs, um, sort of stand-up retail jobs. My first sort of first professional job, for one of a better word, was actually working for um, Lloyd's of London um, in in London for an insurance company. So I was actually a claims assessor, weirdly enough. Um, oh, okay. Didn't go to university like most people um, at my level, and decided to go out there and join the big bad world. And so I was working in the insurance field and. It gave me a very good um, early appreciation for the work in life, particularly for one main reason. I was dealing with brokers who, as I'm sure Sarah will know, are a certain type of breed of individual um, for all of their ups and downs, but also working with um, insurance underwriters. So at that point in time, insurance underwriters were um, quite a sort of stuffy bunch of individuals and, and quite gruff in the way that they sort of manage their day to day. So I had these two groups of individuals that I had to liaise with. So it taught me very early on how to sort of communicate effectively at those two levels. Wonderful. Love it. Now, everyone out there that is um, trying to view on LinkedIn, um, it's actually not streaming on LinkedIn. So just jump onto the YouTube channel. Their message is in the box. Uh, now let's talk recruitment. Um, I, but I want to I want to talk about when you've been a candidate, when you've interacted with a recruiter or a talent acquisition professional. I want to hear about an experience, whether it's positive or negative, where you were the candidate and what made it so memorable. So I'll start with you, Anthony. Tell me about a candidate experience from your career. Yeah, great. Look, I'll talk about the experience to land my existing role. I was uh, approached by a um, a recruiter and right from very early in the process it was clear that it was going to be a really engaging process and i think the highlight for me the reason i'm calling that out as a really positive experience is i got to meet with a really wide variety of people as you probably expect when you're coming into a ceo role but the most important component for me that i think is more broadly applicable is i got to meet with a couple of the people that i would be working with if i was successful in the role so i met with our cfo and our chief people officer during the recruitment process and it gave me a brilliant opportunity to really understand what the culture of the business was going to be like before i joined and that interview was both a bit of a grilling up front, but it turned into a really positive experience where by the end, those two individuals were really advocating for me through the process. And so, you know, that notwithstanding, it was just brilliant as part of the, the overarching recruitment process to meet a couple of people from the team. And mm. I'll, I'll also give you a negative, it's a really quick and simple one. When you apply for a role and just never hear anything back, it's a horrible experience. Uh, and I'm sure that no candidate ever enjoys that, irrespective of what role they're applying for. And it happens way too often. Uh, it's very, very interesting. Um, thankfully, my community, the rubber band community, we're very passionate about candidate experience, but uh, we've all been in that um, situation. And it does stick with you. And I think it really when you don't hear from an organization or you receive a negative candidate experience it really impacts that brand if, if you're a consumer or uh yeah. whatever it might be it, it, it really does it, it tarnishes it so yeah completely agree with that how about yourself sarah talk us through a, an experience positive or negative where you were the candidate and what made it so memorable uh, so the experience i'm just going to talk about is about me coming to australia so uh -huh. i was originally contact contacted um been asked a question haven't you always wanted to work in australia well my answer was no i'd never been to australia uh, never been out this way i was quite happy working in the uk but i know that the insurance industry is a very small industry and some of the people in australia and the business that I was being um courted for i knew people in the uk so i said yes i would meet the head of recruitment who just so happened to be coming across to the uk that 30 minute conversation or 30 minute coffee turned into a few hours of conversation. And the reason that it made it a difference for me is the particular individual spoke so highly about not just the company, but about the role and could pick up on the things that I was talking about and, and translated that into how it would be a challenge 
and how it would be something really exciting for me. It wasn't about the location because I hadn't mm. been to Australia. It was about the job and it was about mm. the challenge that it would provide. And the individual was so passionate about that and about the company he worked for that I was going, I'm, I've bought into this. And the only reason I actually carried on the conversation was because of that initial coffee chat. Mm. I then met a number of different people, um, both of which both you and Mark know. Um, and if it not been for those two individuals, I would never have come to Australia and I would never have had the opportunity to be a chief exec. So right back to that experience is I owe an awful lot. Oh, that's that's such an amazing story. And I I, I think it's, it's it's really valuable advice for people out there. I mean, you know, we, we do get approached by recruiters, whether you're a recruiter yourself or whether you're in, in, in any industry. And I always say, have the coffee. It's half an hour of your time and you never know where it's going to lead you to. So I'm so glad that you had that coffee um, and I'm so yeah. glad that you came to Australia. So what, what yeah, an incredible story. Too. Yeah, wonderful. How, thank, how you. About yourself? How, thank you. Uh, how about yourself, Mark, an experience positive or negative where you were the candidate and what made it really stand out? What made it memorable? It's interesting. It's such a combination of the events and Sarah's story. So it's, again, my first role moving to Australia. Um, I've been uh, contacted by a recruitment agency who... Um, approached me for a, it was a general manager of finance role, um, a large large corporate based here in Melbourne. And the uh, recruiter I met with and had a coffee and he said, look, there's a role going, I think you're going to be excellent for, I think you're going to be really enjoy what the company has to offer, et cetera, et cetera. But he said, the only issue is the hiring manager internally is, is well renowned as being a bit, a bit gruff and a bit old school. And he said, you know, you need to embrace that. He said, but if you get on well with this person, I truly believe this is going to be an amazing opportunity. And so we went and met with the hiring manager who had been in the role for 40 years when I met him. So very, very much old school um, manufacturing industry. Within two minutes of the interview, um, the hiring manager said to me, do you like wearing tires? And I said, personally, no. And he said, good, take yours off, leave the room, come back in and we can talk. And so it's exactly what we all did. We went outside, we took our tires off, we came in. And the only reason I was able to sort of say no at that point in time was the recruitment agency said to me, You've got to stand firm on your decision. You've got to have a view with this person. You've got to be strong. It doesn't matter whether you agree or disagree. And it was that one piece of advice. And so had I walked into their room not having had that advice, I wouldn't know what to have done. But basically, he asked me a question and said, stand by it. And so as it turned out, I got the job. Uh, within an hour, we were out celebrating over lunch. And seven years later, I was still there. So oh, wow. there's that buy-in from that recruitment agency who knew exactly this was the right place for me and it was the right person for that organization. But it was that last piece of advice to get through the door, basically. So I'll, I'll be forever in debt to that person. Oh, that's wonderful. What a great, what a great story. And, you know, there are so many amazing recruitment professionals out there that really do go into that detail and get you really well prepared for those interviews. I think, you know, unfortunately, recruitment agencies had a bit of a reputation, you know, like used car salesmen at one stage. But I think, you know, when you're finding the right people with a really strong values alignment that partners closely with you, it's, it's amazing. I think that's a really great example of that. So let's talk about what talent acquisition and recruitment really is. I mean, we as an industry, we, we always talk about how we want a seat at the table, but I think sometimes we don't actually listen to our CEOs um, and, you know, we, we make a lot of assumptions. So I would love to know as a CEO, what does talent acquisition and recruitment really mean to you? What, what do we do? What's it all about? Anthony, tell me from, from your perspective. Yeah, I think it's an underrated business partnering function. It's, uh, I mean, leveraging Mark's story, the ability to intimately understand what's happening in the organisation, who the key people are, what the culture looks like, and then representing that to potential candidates from the perspective of creating an employee value proposition. I think TA in particular becomes the face of your employer brand. And I know, Eden, you know, you did a fantastic job of creating an employer brand when we worked together at Flybys and became famous to the point where that was influential in bringing um, really great talent to that business. And I think the TA function is an underrated capability to build that employer value proposition and to really act as the, the conduit between the best talent in market and the reality of the role, whether, you know, at, Again, leveraging Mark's experience, where there are some elements of the role that perhaps could be swept under the under the carpet, and it's a bit of a surprise on day one or beyond. So, you know, having that holistic conversation 
through the journey is really valuable so that every candidate coming in knows what they're getting themselves in for, both in terms of the positives and some of the things that need to be improved from an opportunities perspective. So I think an absolutely critical business partnering function. Wonderful. So so wonderful to hear. I hope, hope the audience out there is listening to that. Have a chat to your CEO. They do value what you do. Well, I hope they all do. Um, how, how about yourself, Sarah? What, what does talent acquisition and recruitment mean to you? Yeah, I definitely echo those comments. Um, I do think both TA and recruitment hold a massive significance in the success of an organisation. I, I always ask all leaders in our business to have a people pipeline. But the mm. reality is, unless they focus on it, it falls by the wayside. And when it comes to then, uh, you know, looking to replace a vacancy, people end up scrabbling around. Whereas if you actually do within your organization or even you use an external company, focus on that. I think both TA and, and recruitment can help you acquire top talent. You know, so they, they can identify those with the right skills, the expertise, innovative thinking to help you plug a gap within your own organization. It can help you build high performing teams if you understand where you've got gaps in your organization, then you get the diverse thinking by bringing different individuals into your organization. You can help get that right individual who can make a significant difference. And I think if, if they really understand your business, it does help create that um, performance culture in your organization, that positive company culture. You know, because if you work closely with somebody who really understands your goals, your strategy, your values, then they can actually seriously help you get that right individuals can help you grow and, and and be successful. And then once you've got them in, if they found the right individuals and you can actually build on that capability, you can then retain top talent as well. So Absolutely. a huge part. Agreed. I think there is so much more to it than just hiring. Or yeah, finding absolutely. people, or filling roles. You know, it's it's really deep strategic talent management that has such an impact on an organisation. So I love that perspective. Thanks so much, Sarah. Uh, how about yourself, Mark? What what does talent acquisition and recruitment mean to you? Yeah, so it's an interesting one. This for me. I mean, for me, it comes down to one simple word: it's an opportunity. So I think some of the best uh, talent acquisition people I've worked with have both sold the company to candidates as well as selling the candidate to the organization, right? So it comes back to Anthony's point about being that conduit between the two. I think that's so, so important. But the other one for me is, is the nuances of candidates that where the recruitment agency, internal or external, can come to you with a candidate and say, look, they can fill this role and they can demonstrate this role. However, they can also help you achieve A, B, and C because of their background or because of their way of thinking or whatever it might be. And so to Sarah's point, it's, how can they help me um, you know, fulfill my strategic plan outside of just the pure simple fact it's the person for the role? You know, it's what else do they bring to the role as an individual? Because nine times out of 10, and, and you guys would know more than most, you know, there are so many candidates for one role. So what else can they do? What else can they bring to the organization? So for me, it's that recruitment agent is, is knowing that person, having that relationship to the point where they can then sell that candidate to me as much as the other way around. 100%. I've had a really interesting question come up. So I'm just going to, to bring that up. Um, and thank you so much for, for this question, Alicia. I think it's a really great one for a lot of people in the talent acquisition and, and recruitment industry. So how how would uh, your TA team or, you know, recruitment partner get FaceTime with you if, if they don't have that opportunity currently? So you know, you're very busy, um, you have busy schedules. So, you know, how, how would a recruitment team or a recruiter, talent acquisition professional start that conversation with you? How, how do you want us to approach you? Anthony, what, what's your, what, are, what are your thoughts? Yeah, look, I'm going to talk about a specific challenge in our industry as an example of how to get, um, you know, great face time. So we work heavily in the technology space um, and from an innovation perspective, we are constantly looking for the best technology talent and specifically in the space um, of mobile app development, which I'm sure there's a bunch on the on the call that are finding it very difficult to recruit and, and retain um, mobile mm -hmm. app developers. And for me personally, I don't quite understand the challenge. So a great way of engaging with me would be to bring that problem to us um, as, a, as an exec leadership group and as a CEO, but bring it from the perspective of what you're seeing out in market, what insights do you have and what potential solutions could there be to solving that problem? And maybe you need my, my support on something. Maybe it's about 
you know, having me support with the creation of an employee value proposition that resonates with that group of individuals based on what you know about them and partnering to jointly solve that common business problem. So if I see a request come through that's around identifying a really key business need and then potential solutions to that business need, I'll always make time. Yeah. I'm agreed. I think, you know, in, in my experiences working with, with yourself and, and, you know, working with the CEO that we had at, at Flybys, being able to present that this is the problem that I'm facing and here are some ideas that I've got. Could we go over that together? And it was always the experience I had with the leadership team at Flybys that you are open to it. So, Sarah, what about yourself? You know, if, if your team were facing a particular challenge and wanted to get some face time with you, how, how would they approach that? How, how should they reach out to you? A similar sort of thing. I think we're all facing uh, the war for talent, aren't we? Attracting and retaining talent. So this is the prime time for TAs to get in front of their chief exec. Now, it may be that I know one traditional way of recruiting, but they might open my eyes to many other different ways. And they've got to be able to say that I just need to be able to spend a bit of time to explain what the best way we're actually being able to hire people or the best way for us to be able to take talent. It's not just the traditional way it used to be but then they come up with a number of different scenarios. And I'd be definitely open to hear that because I'm learning something myself. Um, it helps fix a problem that we've all got. And we mm. all want to be that one that can actually crack it more so than our competitors. So mm. this is the time when it, you'll, you'll find it easy to get in front of your chief exec. Great advice. Mm. Agreed. Um, any, anything you'd like to add, Mark? Yeah, for me, um, so we deal mainly with um, external recruitment as opposed to internal. But for me, it's about being proactive rather than reactive. So one of the worst things I know in my own experience is I will often reach out to people in the talent acquisition space when I need to do something, which is absolutely the wrong time to do it. But again, if you start to forge those relationships with CEOs about knowing what's coming up, like what's in the calendar for the next three months, you know, particularly when there's major events, so there's strategic planning coming up or whatever it might be, things that the TA team can start to make an impact to and knowing it's coming up, I think that's often the best time to sort of get involved in that process as opposed to sort of wait for that conversation to come back your direction, basically. So I think the more ahead you can get in it will certainly help. And selfishly, from my point of view, I would much rather plan for a problem that's going to happen or a resolution in three months' time than something in three days' time. So that's a that's a personal view for me. I agreed. And and look, it's a really great segue, Mark, into the next question. And 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 thanks, Anthony and Sarah, too. Um, because as a, as a talent acquisition industry or recruitment industry, we really do focus a lot on metrics. So we report on everything. We've got so many data points that come through. But what, what data would you gain the most insights from? So what should we be sending you? What should we be providing you? Um, and like to keep you informed of what's going on, you know, what, what would you like to receive from, from your recruiters and talent teams? Anthony, I'll start with yourself. Yeah, look, I, I probably struggled a bit with this question, to be honest. And um, for me, it's um, a lot of internal metrics. I'd probably prefer to see more about what's happening out in market and um, any reliable stats that you've got about what's happening in, in that market. I spoke previously about the challenge we've got in our business in hiring mobile app developers, I would love some market stats about what that means, what that looks like. Where where are they? What's the path to bringing them in and what do we need to do differently? I think some of those stats, uh, or some insights around what that could look like and what we could do as a business to, to support a, an easier journey for those more critical roles. Um, mm. and I, I think just generally the ability to benchmark what you're seeing in your own organisation once candidates do come in and become great talent in your organisation. So the other thing that I thought about was our employee engagement surveys and employee pulse checks. How are we performing relative to what's out in market? And one of the things that I always look at is what was the expectation of a team member versus the reality once they landed in role? How closely were those two things matched? And if there are any stats that's that are available publicly in the market in terms of how well you do, I think that would be an, an interesting um, benchmark for me to be looking at. I love that, Anthony. I think there's so much more power in, you know, not just providing, hey, these are how many roles we've filled, but actually looking at 
what a successful hire looks like. And that can be all things like performance and engagement. So actually providing data from the roles that you filled six months ago to be able to show, okay, this is how that candidate is working out. And this is, you know, their experience. This is uh, versus the reality. I, I think that's absolutely spot on. How about yourself, Sarah? What, what kind of metrics and reporting, what kind of data would you get the most insights from? How should we be keeping you informed? Well, look, I agree that every industry needs information about their own industry, and I'm not quite sure we've got that to the level that we all need it. Mm. And what you find is external recruiters or TAs have probably got that information, but just not captured in a way that makes it easy to be able to send on to chief execs. But assuming we have that, the other things I'd be um, keen to know about is time to fill. How, mm. how long does it take to actually get somebody in in your organisation? Um, is it is it... Is it taking too long? Is that mean there's something about the brand? Is it something about the role? Is there a different way that we could articulate it? Um, going back to my sourcing channel, uh, which one's the most popular now? Is there, mm. Do you get different results through different channels? Personally, I don't know. Um, yeah. So I'd be keen to be able to know that. And, and like Anthony, I'd, I'd really like to know a candidate's experience you know, it might be as they go through the process, but when they've actually come on board and be part of our organisation, is there things that we could have done differently? Is it is the reality different from what they were sold? Does the people who are, who are the first one they come into contact with in our organisation, are they selling the job, selling the brand, selling the company, as well as it was sold to me? Mm. That's the thing I, I would like to know. and Because I think it helps in terms of your turnover rates. If you get the right people come in, they're going to stay for a bit longer. So I'm, I'm keen to know that too. Yeah, absolutely. Agree. 100% agree. And I, and I think, you know, that that's, it's always been, you know, part of what I try to share with my exec leader teams when I've been in roles, because I think you, you do, you want to know if it is taking too long, yep. the exec leaders are the ones that can empower you, whether it's from a budgeting perspective or an experience perspective or educating hiring managers on how to provide an effective candidate experience and the impact that that can have. So 100%, I, I agree with all of that, Sarah. I think that's really, really great advice for, for the audience. Mm. How about yourself, Mark, um, in terms of metrics and reporting and data and what, what gives you the best insights? What should we be sending you to keep you informed? So for me, it's, um, I mean, we're, we're in a sort of smaller organisation, so within the NFP world, it's quite a small world. But the data I'm, I'm always looking for is, you know, what's happening in, in my sector specifically. So it's come back to what Anthony and Sarah said. I want to know what my, you know, my other organisations are very similar to me, who they're looking for, what they're looking for, and why. Because I think, mm. you know, in a space where certain candidates and certain skill sets, and I use the NFP as a good example, is so niche, if we're all looking for very similar roles at a very similar time, well, that's just going to make life very, very difficult. So again, it's it's known what other organisations similar to mine are doing, how are they succeeding, how are they achieving it. So I think it's more um, sector-led or industry-specific information as opposed to the more generic data sets would be much more useful for me personally. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, that it's really important to benchmark your data against the industry data because, yeah. you know, if... I can imagine what if if you're receiving a time to hear, time to fill um, stat, it's going to be very different to Sarah. It's going to be very different to Anthony. So you want to have that context behind it mm -hmm. and what it means, you know. And and it's not just industry; it's breaking it down. You know, uh, Anthony gave a really good example of you know mobile devs, and that's been a a, a challenge for people for the last three years. So mm -hmm. you don't want to then be benchmarking yourself against hiring call center people because it's a completely different sector and a completely different story that you're trying to tell to attract people in. So I, I think that's wonderful. Um, tell me just more generally, um, talent acquisition teams, external recruitment partners. What are you looking for? What, what's the value they can bring? Uh, what do you expect from them? T tell me, Anthony, what, what, what do you feel? First of all, apologies that my camera seems to have gone a bit uh, left of centre. This is on brand for us. Cash Awards uh, primary colour is a, is a purple hue, so um, I'm, I'm right on brands. Um, look, I, I think that the key word there is partnering, and for me, partnering to deeply understand what happens in the organisation and what's happening in market and being a conduit between those two is, is the most important thing. Um, I have 
probably done a bit of a 180 when it comes to talent uh, acquisition as a result of yourself, Eden, and the great experience that I had at, uh, at Flybys. I think um, prior organisations hadn't operated talent acquisition as effectively as I had seen you do, you do it. And um, I had probably had a skew towards external recruitment and the challenge with that was always they they are engaged for such a short period of time and they they do a job for you and it's a bit hit and miss as to how effective that is but they seem to be able to tap into broader parts of the market yeah. so coming back to what a good ta um you know a, a, a great ta um resource internally does for you is is really partner with you to deeply understand what needs um, are most pressing in the organization and then really partner with you to to find the best candidate out in market and i've just found that's a much more effective way of going about it from an internal perspective because um ta being a persistent um capability internally builds up that that knowledge of strategy and business culture um mm. for me it's a much more effective way of going about things so I, I would really bring it back to partnering with your key business um business leaders love it wonderful great advice how about yourself, Sarah? What, uh, what, what are your expectations of your talent team and external recruitment partners more broadly? Yeah, very similar to Anthony here in, in terms of internally. I think they've got to really understand your business. They've got to really understand your culture. They've got to really understand your goals. And they've got to be able to articulate that in a way that makes sense to the people that they're actually wanting to bring on board in your organisation. And absolutely wholeheartedly, it's about teamwork and collaboration. So they do have to work closely with the hiring manager. They've got to be able to understand what that role is, even if they don't really be able to understand the technicalities of the role. They've got to be able to articulate it in a way so they find the right people for that hiring manager. And for me, they've also got to play a part about onboarding somebody when they come into the organisation. It's not I've done the work, I've recruited them and then I never talk to them again. It's somebody else's job. There's got to be that smooth transition across um, mm. to make sure that the candidate doesn't feel left in any way. Mm. You know, you've got to take this all the, all the way through. Um, for external recruitment firms, it's all about building that talent pipeline and networks. They've got access to a lot of people. They need to be able to understand the business that they're working with to make sure that the candidates they're putting in front of them are the ones that would be a good cultural fit. Mm. So, again, you know, for, for whether it's internal or external, there is that teamwork collaboration piece it's about that understanding and that being able to articulate back to the organization and also the candidate yeah absolutely I completely agree and there's such a a strong theme of, of partnership coming out yep. um whether you're external or internal really partnering with the business to get that depth of understanding from whether it's from a culture perspective whether it's from the impact that that position will have when you hire the right person um values all of that's coming out so that that's awesome how, how about yourself Mark, what, what do you expect? You, you mentioned that you do partner with a lot of um, external recruitment agencies and there was a question there if someone was asking ever around um, expectations of a recruitment agency. So, yeah, what, what are you looking for? What's important to you? So, to, to build on sort of what Anthony and Sarah said, for me, there's a, I have an expectation, this might be too high, but I expect to be challenged. Um, and by which I mean, you know, I have pre, often have preconceived notions about the reasons why I want certain roles and this is what it's going to do. But having that sounding ball with someone who works in that space and you know, that no one knows candidates better than the talent acquisition or an external recruiter. So I want them to come back to me and go, look, why are you asking for that? And it might still be the same outcome, but it's that yeah. question about why, you know, don't just assume that you're given this scope of work and therefore go fill it because unfortunately, that, you know, a bad recruitment can often end because that hasn't been challenged along the line. So for me, um, particularly in external recruiters, I, I want them to challenge both the, you know, the roles I'm looking for, the, the places I'm looking, the candidates I'm looking for, all of it. Um, and again, the most important, and I had it not that long ago, is someone challenged the decision why a candidate was rejected. And so yeah. we were able to talk that through and go, well, why did you? Because from their perspective, they were a very good candidate. And once it had been explained, Oh, actually, that's a good conversation. Maybe we should think about that. But again, it was the that, that next one question is a really important question. So um, for me, it's about um, yeah, getting external recruiters to, to challenge preconceived ideas, basically. Yeah, I think that's that's awesome. I think that challenge is really important. And 
when I reflect of when I've had really strong partnerships in organisations and when my team have, have been really effective, it does come down to the challenge because often roles aren't even designed by the talent team. So being able to challenge the role to say, hey, I'm talking to people in the market, this isn't going to excite them. We need to really reevaluate what this role will look like. But then also I always, particularly when I have new team members joining my team, I tell them to attend the interviews and, and challenge. And, and I think, you know, people do want that. Hiring managers do want that. They want to open up the conversation. They don't want all the responsibility to lay with them. They want your expertise to be able to say, yeah. hey, I actually disagree. I thought they presented this really well. I thought they presented that really well. I think they'll bring diversity to the team from a thought diversity perspective or cultural diversity or gender or whatever it might be. Challenge, yeah. challenge, challenge. It's really yeah. important. And you know, I, I I believe our CEOs and our execs want that. They don't want us to be an operational machine behind the scenes and giving all the responsibility to you as the hiring manager. So I love that. That's that's wonderful. That's that's really great advice for everyone out there. But let's do now. We're going to do a stop, start, continue exercise. I'm going to go around the room. So what should we stop doing? What should we start doing? And what should we continue doing? Anthony, what's what's your perspective? Look, stop sending long lists. It's rare, um, but I did have a, an external recruiter last week send me a list of about 20 candidates for a role. Um, oh. And it just takes both me and, and our chief people officer a lot of time to wade through a list of 20 people. I, I guess I'm probably expecting for that list to have been culled to six, seven and, and really get laser focused on the, you know, on, on the top talent and the best fit. Um, so that's probably an easy one. Start for me is providing um, a regular view of market insights. So I spoke um, previously about perhaps struggling a little bit with which KPIs and which metrics or, or market data um, would be most useful. For me, that would be an amazing thing to, to build up. And I'll actually go a little bit off piece here. And there was a comment um, asking for our views on bringing in um, graduates or mm. I think it's graduates. And I think that's a great question. You know, for me personally, I would love to know what does that look like for our organisation? What do the stats tell us about how many graduates are being hired? What are other organisations doing? If if you in TA and, and the recruitment space could help us form that strategy for how to tap up the best talent early on in their career and then pro provide a pathway into, a, into our organisation and, and a support mechanism for doing that. I mean, we've got a fairly small organisation, only 200 people. Um, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be out there looking for the best graduates coming into market and giving them an alternative to going to one of the bigger um, bigger organisations. And in terms of continue, I think we've probably overused this, but I just can't stress the importance enough is building great relationships and being a great business yeah. partner. Yeah, 100%. Agree, agree with all of that. And thank you so much for answering that, that grad question. And thank you um, for, for asking that question as well from the audience. Um, Sarah, stop, start, continue. What should we stop doing? What should we start doing? What should we continue doing? I'm trying to think of different things to Anthony, right? So stop, <laughs> um, stop relying on traditional sourcing methods. Come up with something that's a bit different. Capture my imagination. Tell me something I don't know. Mm. Don't replay back the short list that I've given you um, because you, you would know more people than I would and be able to uh, identify different candidates that I might not have thought of. Um, Start, you know, the, the building long term relationships with people, leveraging that data and analytics. Again, that will tell us something a little bit different. It might. It might identify something that chief execs aren't aware of mm -hmm. uh, the continue piece again, collaboration with with hiring managers. Absolutely effective communication. Keep people informed um, the continuous learning and, and adapting like everybody needs to in a in the new world going forward. Um, I think it is an evolving industry. It's it's one where if we stay up, up to date on trends, then I think we've got greater opportunities from that. Yeah, yeah, 100% agree, agree with all. Um, wonderful advice. How about yourself, Mark? Uh, what should we stop doing, start doing, continue doing? Uh, so for me, the stop and the start are very similar. I would plead with the stopping of generic data. Um, yeah. generic trends, generic analysis, uh, that doesn't specifically impact my business or my ability to do my job. So I think that's the big one for me. And I think, you know, similarly to the start is start telling me something new, give me some a bit of information, analysis, a trend, an insight that is somehow relevant that 
I probably wouldn't have thought about. You know, we've got a lot of people out there analyzing, and don't get me wrong, analyzing a lot of data. I just would love to hear something different. Did you know that so and so is doing this? And so, yeah, whatever it might be. So, I think that's a start for me is providing those uh, valuable insights. And for me to continue is continue to challenge everything. That's a that's a rule in our business across the board. But I think it's a good rule to take through is challenge every decision in the right possible way and challenge the the thought behind those decisions. So I think the more people that can do that, um, yeah, I think it will be in a much better space. Yeah, agreed. I, I want to ask a question. It's um, not one I've prepared you for. I do apologise, but it's a, a, um, I did receive a, a text message up on my phone there. They they didn't pop it in the in the box. Um, We've, we've been impacted as an industry in the technology sector where there's been a bit of a crash um, in, you know, in terms of coming from the US. So a lot of organisations have, you know, have downsized or they've stopped hiring and it's impacted talent acquisition professionals because they're not hiring. Um, you know, CEOs and execs figure, well, we're not hiring, we don't need recruiters in the team at the moment. Uh, someone uh, just reached out to me to ask to say, what can they do to prove their worth in terms of other areas that they could bring benefit to an organisation so that they can future-proof the talent acquisition function? So if that ever happens in their industry again, that they will be protected and providing other benefits to an organisation and focusing on, on other skills that they can bring. Do, do any of you have an opinion on that or any advice on that? I thought it was quite a quite a good question. I'm not sure if it would answer the question explicitly, uh, Ian, but for me, it's, I mean, it, those those blips and those downturns are only ever going to be short-lived. Um, and the problem mm -hmm. is when we want to turn the tap back on, it's impossible to turn it on overnight. So again, it comes back to that point I was making earlier on again. If you know that there is going to be this town turn um, in the volume of work, how do you get organizations ready so that when they do want to proceed with ABC in the future, that they can get ahead of that a lot a lot quicker, basically? Because the longer those roles stay vacant for when you do turn the tap back on, that's when it costs the business, you know, that, that time, that effort, that money. So for me, I think the only thing I can say to that is how do you get both parties ready for when you need to turn the tap back on? I think that's great advice because my advice, and, and thank you so much for asking it, is to make sure that when you are really busy, that you are continuing to do talent pipelining, succession planning, um, effective talent management, do that now. Don't wait for the downturn because then organisations already know the worth that you can provide that. And when the tap comes back on, you're ready to go. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree. Is Anthony, anything you'd add to that? I think it's the talent management approach, both pipeline for the future, but also existing. So where you've got recent new hires or... Um, you know, candidates in, in the business who are, are relatively new to the organisation, you know, some of the effective things that, um, that I've seen you know, that, that you did was a really robust onboarding approach for mm. new candidates. Now, I know that we're talking about, you know, what, what if that dries up? But I think the best experience or uh, the, the best thing to do for a new candidate is to provide them a brilliant onboarding experience. So that shows real value add from your TA partners I think the other bit um, that I've got real value out of, and it probably blurs the lines a little bit with your HR business partner in, in some of the bigger organisations, but is about capability mapping for roles. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we're seeing is, you know, particularly amongst younger um, team members is they're very ambitious and they want that promotion. They want to step up and take on more responsibility. But I think there needs to be a, a really clear vision outline for what the actual capabilities and skill sets are required for that, that next role and then articulating how, how that talent might get support when they're in the organisation to acquire those skills and to show those capabilities. So you're, you're extending through the life cycle of team members coming into an organisation far beyond getting them into day one. You're, you're really thinking about then how do you set them up for success to deliver and then potentially to proceed to progress within the organisation so that that capability mapping with your HR business partner, um, really valuable. I think that's awesome advice because, and, and look, blur the lines, right? Everyone out there watching and listening, the, the line between a HR business partner and a talent acquisition professional should be blurred. You should be working yeah. together. Yeah. Um, it, you shouldn't be working in silos and it does happen too often. And I've been in roles where it's been like that, that talent acquisition sat very separately and you know you'd have an OD team or a business partnering team doing all the capability work but you need to partner together uh it's it's really important um Sarah any any advice from yourself well if I if I give you a real life example then uh, when COVID first hit a lot of organizations 
weren't hiring people they were just looking to manage with the people that they've got and not not cause any impacts to them but we knew that there was going to be a, a challenge of finding talent coming in so our internal talent acquisition team started to look at doing a grad program oh, looking great. bringing people from outside industry you know so we might have a specialism of transport how do i find people from the transport industry not insurance but how you can bring those into the organization and they pivoted a little around um just thinking a bit differently as to how we can then bring talent into the organization and start to grow our own so that was bringing people in and then the second bit which such on what anthony said is is that then how do you then develop your talent internally and look for those opportunities because people are looking for that career progression and started to they worked with the hr business partners to start to create those career pathways and yeah. and start to really focus properly on talent and what that meant and so then you knew when opportunities came up promotions came up in the last two years i probably promoted more people internally as a result of that year of doing the hard graft to get us to yeah. this stage yeah wonderful that's that's great advice thank you so much uh just conscious of time now we've we've hit our 45 minutes so we'll go around just some final advice for the audience um anthony what would your final piece of advice be oh look don't underestimate your value as a business partner we spoke about it a lot in this session you know you are so valuable to the organization in terms of bringing the best and and most relevant talent in and then supporting their onboarding journey through to becoming, you know, really great. Every business is underpinned by the quality of its people, and that starts with you as a group. So never underestimate the value that you bring from a business partnering perspective. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Anthony. Um, Sarah, final piece of advice for the audience. Well, I'm going to finish off with one of the questions you, you started in the beginning about our own positive experience. So we can all uh, relay that all thinking about how we came into an organization. If these people on the, on the call think about how they wanted to be treated, what was their positive experience? And then deliver that time and time again, they'll get people who want to work with them. Love it. And yes, the audience out there, remember your CEO has been a candidate. They understand, <laughs> they've been on the other side. So <laughs> they know. Um, Mark, how about yourself? Final piece of advice. I um, say, so I've spent a lot of time with uh, external recruiters over the last few years. So. Um, my advice for any external group is be an ambassador for your client. Um, you know, yes, you're an external party, but you know, you're actually out there represents them. So know their business, talk about it, love it, you know, sell it basically. So that's my advice is be an ambassador for your client. Wonderful. Well, Anthony, Sarah, and Mark, it's been such a privilege to have three CEOs come come and talk to the community today. I, I really appreciate you taking the time out. And I think just taking the time out to do this shows that CEOs do care about talent acquisition. You do care about recruitment. Uh, so I just wanted to really, really thank you for joining us today. It's been an absolute pleasure having you here. Thank you. Thanks, Aidan. Thank, thank you so much. I'll let you get back to your busy days. But yeah, take care and thanks again. And thanks to the thank audience. You. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Thank Cheers, you. Bye-bye.